uh, RV will be presenting the initial slides and I'll be closing the presentation later on. So RV, please. Yes, okay. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila and Sir Zani. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We are glad to present to you today the results of our study entitled Modern Biotechnology Application and Regulation in the Philippines Issues and Prospects. So uh, this is the outline. It's just there to give you a general flow of the presentation. So I will be tackling numbers one to five, while Dr. Sani Domingo will focus on the challenges, key insights, and recommendations. So throughout this study, you will be encountering um, a series of concepts, and it is important that we define and qualify them first for us to have a basic grasp or understanding. So biotechnology is simply a set of tools that uses living organisms to make or modify, develop, or improve. And modern biotechnology falls under it. It is comprised, with, it is comprised of different technologies like uh, genetic engineering, gene manipulation, and genetic makeup. It's um, primarily, um, it primarily deals with the insertion or the manipulation of genetic material. And one of its products is, a genet is the genetically modified crop, or what we know as GMOs. So in that essence, uh, modern biotechnology proposes to solve um, perennial sectoral problems on food security, agricultural productivity, pest and disease resistance, and micronutrient deficiency. Okay, so um, as the climate climate events continue to worsen, the role of biotechnology is deemed as crucial in the growing demand for food and resources. So in the case of the Philippines, the introduction of biotech crops was through BT corn, and it was not immediately followed by other GM crops. So this prompted the study to review regulatory application and structures to investigate why this was so and to pinpoint areas for optimization and check and balance. So generally, the study determined the issues and prospects in the application and regulation of modern biotech in the Philippines agricultural sector. Specifically, the study reviewed policy and related regulatory processes, conducted case studies on technology development and commercialization, and recommended ways forward for agriculture and modern biotechnology. So in the international scale, around 71 countries have adopted biotech crops. It accumulated to around 190.4 million hectares, and the highest adoption is from soybean, followed by maize, cotton, and canola. And, uh, and as of 2019 data, Philippines ranked 12th, making it a mega biotech country. In the Asian production of biotech corn, Philippines contributes um, 0.9 million hectares. So this large, um, this large adoption figures are mainly attributed to high farm income benefits. It was estimated to be 200,000 million US dollars between 1996 to 2016 the highest of which comes from herbicide-tolerant soybean. And in the case of the Philippines, BT corn um, returns a net income of 85 million. And for stack rates, it, go it goes as high as 6.422 billion. As for the environmental aspect, uh, biotechnology um, there are studies that cite that biotechnology reduces pesticide costs and increased environmental benefits. So what you're seeing now is a table of active, ingre active ingredient usage from pesticides, and um, there is an estimated 18.4% change in environmental impact. It also decreased pesticide expenditure by 38%. And some studies have cited that biodiversity gains were valued at 150 billion US dollars. So in another study, the PSA cost and return studies in 2013 um, have noted that hybrid corn in the Philippines tend to have higher farm inputs. So as you can see here, they have higher um, figures for the usage of fertilizer 
and the usage of pesticides compared to their open pollinated variety counterparts. However, they also return as much as um, four times higher farmer net returns compared to the other uh, varieties. So in the domestic landscape, as mentioned earlier, BT corn was the first commercially available GM crop in the Philippines. It underwent regulatory process under Dow 2208, and it was relatively fast due to mature technology. It means that technology development is already finished and um, the country does not necessarily need to um, conduct further research on that area. So between the three islands in the three major islands in the Philippines, Luzon has the biggest adoption area for stack rates, followed by Mindanao. And interestingly, Visayas has lower figures for stack rates and highest for insect resistant BT corn. Generally, however, we see that there is high preference for stack rates over the two varieties despite their earlier adoption. So for context, um, insect-resistant corn um, started in 2003, herbicide tolerant in 2006, and stack rates only started in 2007. So among the regions, region two dominates in the figures. So which institutions and policies have been influencing our regulatory framework and processes. Here we provide you um, a timeline. It started in 1990 when the OST and CBP was established. And then um, in 2000, Philippines entered Cartagena Protocol. In 2002, the AAO 2008 was um, issued and DA Biotech was the only assessor. In 2010 and to 2012, um, a series of field trials were conducted for a BT eggplant. And in 2015, the Supreme Court ruled against it based on the petition filed by um, Greenpeace, um, imposing the, um, invoking the rate of Calicasan, and um, it nullified Dow 2008. That led to the creation of JDC 2016-01, which um, added the OST and CBP as an oversight agency along with um, DA and added assessors like um, DNR and DOH. And in observation of bottlenecks and regulatory delays, JDC 2016 was further amended to create JDC 2101, which was just um, approved this March 2002. So it um, combined the assessing bodies into a single joint assessment group and in the future and in the future um, and in the future they are considering um, consolidating all of them into one singular biotech authority so we have observed that regulatory processes and events like um, the field trials of BT eggplant have led to transformations or became catalysts for policy changes and institutional shifts so is the JDC creation a terrible birthing? Did it add regulatory delays or was it a necessary precaution? Here we point out several um, um, key differences between the DA and JDC. So for the assessment, as you can see, there are added agencies there, DNR for environment and DOH for human health. For the consultation process before um, it only required officials from the LGUs, but now if if there are IPs present in the area or if it's within the vicinity of a protected area, there requires additional permits. And it now adds um, an LGU endorsement. For the public hearing, there is only one for DA, which is the field testing and it's optional. And for the GDC, it added confined testing and field trial phases. So I'm going to run through you um, the general process of JDC 2016-01. So the first one is the procedure for proposal. So the only way na uh, makakapag-propose ka if, the, if there is no alternative or foreseeable alternative um, with its domestic counterparts. And for confined tests, um, Public hearing is part of the process, 
but um, this is optional and it will only be it will only be conducted if it is deemed necessary by the um, by safety committees and um, we will now proceed to the field trials so if there are multiple field trials they are evaluated separately and as mentioned earlier added permits are required if the field trial site is within or near ancestral domain or a nationally protected area so they will coordinate with ncip or PAMB, the protected area management board and for the public participation multi-stakeholder consultation is needed and an lgu endorsement will be required um, for the direct use for feed, food feed and processing there are added layers there so um, there now comes additional evaluation from BPIPPSSD for food safety standards, um, Bureau of Animal Industry for feed safety and socioeconomic considerations to be evaluated by an external expert. For the procedure for commercial propagation, um, this will be conducted in parallel, in parallel registration with um, FPA. So the, if it's... Um, if it's um, insecticide resistant, um, they will need to register, th register that with FPA. And um, the addition of FPA came into play only in 2016. And another bottleneck um, possibility here is they request another efficacy trial. So it's different from the field trials conducted. So um, it needs to be harmonized or streamlined to prevent um, further regulatory delays. And um, seed distribution will also be um, discussed in this process, and it will only be allowed for SEC registered bodies. So, so far there are 98 um, GM applications under GDC 2016-01 as of March um, 31, as of March 31. Um, there is one approved field trial for golden rice, and there are 58 direct use applications. And for commercial propagation, 12, um, 12 events under BT corn were approved, and golden rice is in the process. So after that, if ma approve yung golden rice, um, seed distribution will start taking place. And soon makikita na siya sa market. Okay, now we go to the key study, which is the economic surplus analysis of BT eggplant. So, um, eggplant production comprises one-third of crop vegetables, production value highest among similar crops. And in 2020, it amounted to 243,000 metric tons. The self-sufficiency ratio is for BT eggplant is 100%. So it means um, the domestic production is sufficient to meet the domestic demand for it. So compared it to the following crops, which also have GM counterparts, for corn, 91.4%, um, rice, 85%, and potato, 81%. However, um, our domestic production of eggplant is very susceptible to fruit and shoot water. It results to about 80% yield loss according to some studies. So, ito po yung mukha ng um, fruit and shoot border. So, it, um, it attacks during the early vegetative stages, fruiting stages. And the event comes from Mahaiko or the Maharashtra Hybrid Company. And it is applied in three countries. So, Bangladesh, Philippines, and India. However, the brinjal, which is this one, is not preferred locally. So, the UPLB IPB, bred it with um, open pollinated, um, bred it with a local um, variety, and we now have F1 hybrid and open pollinated. And according to field trials, um, the farmer's preference is the hybrid variety. So why BT eggplant? It is the only event to undergo three regulatory regimes, so Dow 2002-08, so doon nangyari until field trials, and then it was halted and GDC 2016-01 was, um, was issued and the Supreme Court reversed the decision and um, advocated for 
for a precautionary approach or implementation of the biosafety framework. And it was granted by a safety permit granted for direct use. And it is now undergoing commercial propagation application under JDC 2101. So our methodology uses economic surplus analysis as an ex ante assessment of technology adoption under various market situations and assumptions within a closed economy model. The model was drawn from the work of Alston Norton and Pardi and the BT Eggplant study of Francisco et al. in 2014. So here are the assumptions. The adoption rate was um, the adoption rate was from an expert's opinion, and majority um, were proxy from existing data sets. So there are a series of sensitivity analysis under different scenarios. We'll first tackle the supply elasticity scenarios. Here we see that um, the more the supply reached elasticity, where quantity supply changed at the same proportion with price, the lesser with IRR, the lesser the internal rate of return. So the IRR is greater when supply is relatively inelastic because um, considering the inputs, the production and seasonality and marketing of an eggplant, it cannot easily um, change along with price. And here we're seeing um, cost scenarios. For the base model, um, the IRR is 53.1%. So the higher the cost, the lesser the um, benefit. And um, regulation takes up 35% of development costs according to our key informant interviews. So, and here we're seeing that regulatory costs are really highest, and especially during field trials, and extension costs are also high. So this include travel costs, participatory processes, and these are the longest and most expensive um, phases of a regulatory process. For the adoption scenario, um, this, um, this kind of um, sensitivity analysis hopes to capture the consequences of delays or lags and efficiencies in the regulatory process. So for example, um, if an adoption starts as early as year five, it would result to more than 100% IRR, while a further delay of as much as um, three years or it would start at year 12, it would decrease IRR to about 21.2%. So earlier adoption, higher IRR. And, and with this, um, I will just compare um, the timeline of regulatory process among GM crops. So there are really delays. Um, you can see here that um, it takes very, very long for um, for one to for one GM crop to proceed to the next um, step in the regulatory process. So PRSV papaya so far was discontinued since it has a lower efficacy than Sinta papaya. So hindi siya, um, it cannot um, it's not efficient or it's not effective against PRSV. And P BT cotton will be entering its um, direct use application after its field trials. For golden rice, um, it will it is undergoing commercial propagation, and for BT eggplant, um, it is also on, um, ongoing for commercial propagation. And with that, um, I'll pass on the mic and um, presentation to Dr. Sunny Domingo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, RV. So RV was able to present the, the status of uh, GM crop uh, adaptation in, in the country, as well as the application of uh, the regulatory framework uh, that we have. Uh, what I'm going to do is present to you key insights in terms of uh, what we've seen in us looking at uh, both national and subnational uh, situations, as well as uh, possibly look at uh, alternative courses of action moving forward. 
Okay, as mentioned, uh, this, present, this presentation is actually divided into major components. First one is me uh, uh, summarizing the key insights from what we've seen uh, from our interviews as well as case analysis and actual, actual uh, assessment of our regulatory processes as installed. And then uh, we'll go on and try to recommend possible ways forward. So on the development and uptake of biotechnology products on productivity, as RV mentioned earlier, hybrids are really three to four times more profitable than our open pollinated varieties. Uh, this is applicable to corn. GM corn um, cultivation further lessens uh, the use of uh, labor as well as lessens damages from, uh, from corn borer and the eventual waste on, on harvested commodities. GM corn adoption is highest in the zone, and as mentioned by Arb earlier, stock varieties are preferred. But if you're going to look at what we have in Visayas and Mindanao, there seems to be equal preference uh, on BT uh, corn as well as uh, Roundup Ready corn. Those insect resistance uh, as well as herbicide tolerant varieties that we have in the market. For BT eggplant, uh, what we've seen is really a very economically viable commodity. You know, even with us trying to uh, give the most uh, conservative assumptions in our estimates. And then for golden rice, uh, you have similar productivity with existing varieties, plus the added benefit of uh, micronutrients in the final product. Issues uh, in showing the presentation. Okay, on regulations, so we've seen a very stringent regulatory process. There have been delays in terms of, uh, for example, the application of BT eggplant as well as that of golden rice. Them actually taking uh, more than 20 years, now two decades from uh, technology development to now, which is the approval of uh, commercial propagation. So that's a very long uh, time timeline for us to see uh, the eventual product from the laboratory to the actual fields of our farmers. So JDC 2016-01 introduced added layers to ensure environment and health protection in our system. But uh, in the same line, uh, we somehow extended a bit certain processes within, um, within the policy that we have installed. So there have been massive opportunity, cost, opportunity costs uh, because of these delays and the uh, highly technical vetting process that we are looking at in terms of the process need uh, complements in terms of the organic structure as well as competent uh, personnel within our uh, bureaucracy. We've seen weak mechanisms uh, in terms of uh, revocation grounds pertaining to possible augmentations on monitoring evaluation as required for necessary checks. Further on regulations, we have seen high costs on technology development, investment, uh, particularly the, the whole R&D phase of these uh, uh, undertakings. So as mentioned earlier, more than two decades timeline from technology development to regulatory approval has been seen, particularly for BT eggplant and uh, golden rice. The approval period for GM corn actually took around seven to nine years, no? uh, way back early uh, or mid 1990s to, to early 2000s. But for GM rice and eggplant, we are seeing 10 to 13 years of uh, total required timeline from uh, them starting with the laboratory to actually uh, the bureaucracy approving commercial propagation. Regulatory expenses may be more than 30% uh, of the total investment, which is really quite huge. So it's not that easy for uh, potential technology developers or researchers to get into modern biotechnology research and eventually follow through, uh, going through the required regulatory process we have within the bureaucracy. Next slide, Arvin. So in terms of end-user uptake, 
we can look at market protection and uh, intellectual property issues. Intellectual property rights is outside that of biosafety jurisdiction. Patents are naturally skewed toward multinational technology developers. Uh, because right now, what we have in terms of uh, GM corn are products spoused by our multinationals. You know? BT eggplant as well as uh, GM rice have local counterparts, uh, particularly for BT eggplant, it's being developed at UPLB, and therefore we have control eventually in terms of the final product and its marketing. High seed costs, uh, costs may hinder farmers in terms of their actual technology adoption. This invites the proliferation of substandard and ukai seeds. Uh, we have been hearing a lot of concerns with regard to IP protection of eventual GM crop products. You know? And these include the proliferation of ukai ukai seeds. And uh, anecdotally, uh, they supposedly have captured around 15 to 25% of the seed market. So that's huge. There's no provision lodged in the current regulatory framework or IP, but there is a plant variety protection office within DA, so that has to be augmented in terms of uh, what we have within the bureaucracy. There is a need to enhance the link between technology development and industry uh, stakeholders. Uh, us looking at uh, seed production, distribution, as well as the acknowledgement of what we have on field in terms of the farmers' uh, seed systems. So. Our researchers at UPLB may be developing BT eggplant, but eventually they'll have to market. And that would require a linkage with our stakeholders, industry stakeholders. End user uptake, economic viability, and public welfare. For BT eggplant, all scenarios, as mentioned earlier, are viable with very positive net present value as well as very high IRRs or even the most conservative assumptions. Public participation mechanisms need revisiting, limiting exchanges during confined tests and field trials may not be enough to appease interest groups. So in our conversations with interest groups, those not pro uh, GM commodities, um, a key insight was them trying to look for avenues for exchange. So participation from our communities, from our interest groups, from CSOs probably uh, is very much needed in terms of what we have process-wise. Next slide, Herbie. So what I mentioned defined uh, the major areas uh, in terms of us possibly trying to look for augmentations. And what we have in our next slides are short to medium to long-term possible courses of action in terms of us augmenting what we have, uh, regulation-wise in the country. So for short to medium term interventions, we need to ensure clarity in policy interpretation and implementation, including stakeholder roles and public participation. We need to enhance public consultation and uh, local stakeholder engagement, intensify information education and communication campaigns to address acceptability issues on GM crops, as well as bridge the knowledge and perception gaps among uh, end users as well as among stakeholders as a whole. Put up regulatory and enforcement mechanisms and standards on seed quality, price, distribution, as well as intellectual property. Address organizational structure instability and non-retention of institutional memory due to staff movement for continuity and procedural integrity. So we are looking at uh, just designated individuals looking at uh, functions within the regulatory processes installed. And that's not very much acceptable because uh, any uh, human capital investment that we have on those individuals eventually uh, dissipates no? as they move within the bureaucracy or probably outside in, in other cases. Increase human capital investment personal development initiatives for both R&D and regulatory functions. So it's us augmenting what we have capacity-wise within the bureaucracy, us looking at the, personnel's, uh, the personnel involved in, in both research as well as uh, regulatory vetting, them being capacitated as they are within the bureaucracy. Augment uh, interdepartmental policy 
Uh, this is partially addressed with the recently signed JDC. Uh, I think signed last month uh, by the end of March. So harmonize regulatory flow with coordinated time frame and simultaneous evaluation. Conduct uh, risk assessments and uh, clarify areas of inconsistencies, including delineation of roles among bodies. Rationalize public hearing and community engagements, participations. Streamline assessment periods, rationalize renewal for food feed and processing, field trials, and commercial propagation. So it's us not only looking at streamlining policy, it's us also trying to open up the process, you know, bringing in uh, avenues for, for exchanges of ideas, changes of insights as well. Next slide, Ari. So what we have here is the latest evolution in terms of policy. So we have JDC 2021-01 past last month. With this, we have um, an augmented regulatory process. Still, we have the same institutions, DA, DOS, DNCBT, DNR, DOH, DIL, GBPI, IBC. But uh, in this case, we have the joint assessment group. So instead of us having so many bodies looking at different, different aspects of regulation or by safety, we now have a joint assessment, which is, I think, the more effective and efficient way of, of doing this. So we have a body, a body uh, trying to augment itself, possibly in terms of capacity and trying to also maintain that capacity within that set of individuals. In this case as well, there is exemption in terms of stock traits, uh, as long as the parent materials have been previously approved. The socioeconomic considerations have been also removed from the process as this is outside our biosafety concerns. A major um, change here is also the perpetual approval in terms of the validity of permit, and this is uh, contentious in terms of us also relating this to other stakeholders on modern biotechnology products. LGUs require uh, resolutions and the actual consultation timeline is less than 20 days. Uh, this is um, also with regard to our ease of business policy. Next slide, Arvi. So further pointing out the augmentations in our recent JDC. Uh, in terms of assessment, we have the, the JAG, comprised of the DA, DOS, CDOH, DNR, and biosafety committees. 10 days for individual review in each agency. As mentioned earlier, there is exemption in terms of the stack rates, as long as the parent materials have been approved and the socioeconomic considerations have been removed from the process. Permit-wise, you have as well the field trial, direct use, and commercialization stages of approval. The permits being given by the government will be valid in perpetuity as long as there are no grounds for its revocation. Now, this aspect has to be further uh, specified in detail in the IRR. Consultation-wise, um, in the new policy, there is only one uh, to be done during the field trial phase, public hearing to be done in 20 days with general public in accordance with ARTA and the ease of doing business policy that we have in government. Next slide, Harvey. So for medium to long-term strategies, we have policy revision and institutional augmentation also as a way moving forward, a major way to, to actually augment what we have uh, regulation-wise. So first, we can augment uh, the biosafety framework, EO514. Second, we can pass the well, a legislation on modern biotechnology uh, in whatever form, possibly leading to the establishment of a central authority on, on modern biotechnology. Augment the organic structure and Resource, resource allocation of DA biotechnology centers to support agriculture and industrial development. Harmonize policy with other countries, regional bodies, 
possibly open discussions on the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Protocol on Liability and Redress Integral once GMOs are out in the market. So this is an international set of rules and procedures relating to living modified organisms as applied to damages, possible damages resulting to uh, the adoption of such GMOs and their transboundary movement. And then uh, eventually we need to capitalize on emerging opportunities and expand regulations to cover other uh, organisms as well as other concerns uh, in the market. So we can look at new plant, uh, new breeding techniques, something that's outside modern biotechnology and therefore not included in the regulatory process that we have installed. We can look at uh, GM animal regulation. A lot has been going on in terms of us possibly looking at the entry of uh, GM animals, including GM fish and GM insects. Forestry products, microbial biotechnology as well. And then uh, in the market, uh, looking at low level presence of GM and GM products and possibly labeling of uh, what we have in the market commodity wise. So in the end, it's really us looking at balancing what we have uh, in terms of product safety and us trying to augment the requirements of the agricultural sector, as well as the attached uh, industries down the line. So that's modern biotechnology you know, uh, as we see right now, uh, adoption wise and the government in terms of it trying to instill uh, a process that would safeguard both the environment and the health of uh, the consuming public. I think uh, this is the, the last slide. So with that, uh, we close our presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'll be waiting for your questions.